Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. And thank you so much for coming on this wonderful evening. Um, my name is Oliver Blunt, and I became chairman of the Cornwall Wildlife Trust in November last year after the AGM. Uh, it's been great pleasure, and I'm loving it so far, and thank you for all the support from the Wildlife Trust and, and all the membership as well. Um, for, for this evening, just a, just a couple of words. Um, this uh, meeting was advertised with um, Gillian Burke, um, uh, as, as moderator of the panel this evening. Sadly, I understand she can't come and her mother is unwell. She's gone back to Kenya to, um, to, look, to look after her. So um, um, apologies for that. Uh, however, we have a very able replacement for Gillian. Uh, Carolyn, of course, um, uh, was uh, very uh, willing and, and able to step in. Thank you for doing that, Carolyn. No, no introduction needed. Um, perhaps I would just add, though, on a note of um, slight sadness, shall we say, that Carolyn, as most of you know, I think, will be leaving us next month. Um, she may want to talk a little bit more about where she's going to, um, but I think it'd be fair to say we haven't really lost her in Cornwall, um, and while with her and the Wildlife Trust in her, in her new role, um, we, we will be... Um, partners and friends so, so that that's um, excellent news. Carolyn, I'm just going to hand over to you in that case and um, if you take it from there. Thank you Oliver, um, thank you for the, uh, assuming that everyone knows who I am, some people might not. Um, I'm Carolyn Cadman, I'm Chief Exec of, of Cornwall Wildlife Trust and as, as Oliver said I've got about four weeks left in this role and it's been the happiest working four and a half years of my life so far so I can wholly recommend working for Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Uh, if anyone were ever think about it or volunteering or getting involved with us, it's a brilliant organisation. Um, so, we are here this evening to talk about restoring Cornwall's land, rivers, and seas, and whether the target to achieve 30% is actually possible or not. And to help us do that, we've got some experts, may I call you that? Um, panelists who are going to come now and join me on stage. So, uh, welcome the panelists, please, everybody. <laughs> Um, I should also welcome everyone who's watching on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Um, as we go throughout this hour's discussion, there may be some points at which audio is lost, and those of you at home might just have to bear with us a bit, but um, thank you in advance for your patience. For those of you here in the room, um, the toilets are just out here, the fire exits are out that way and over there. Um, and we're going to have, uh, we're going to hear from the speakers first, um, they're going to then have a conversation with each other. Then we really want some questions from you. So it's an opportunity for you to ask the panellists some questions as well. And that means you at home as well, online. You can put your questions in the chat feed, I think, Tom, underneath the screen. Um, and then we'd love as many of you as possible to stay with us after the event, uh, to talk to each other, to have a pasty, maybe even a, a cheap glass of wine, um, before you head home. So... Here we have the panel. I'm going to start that end. We've got Cheryl Marriott, who's Head of Conservation at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. This is one of the things you might need to bear with us on as we work out where if I move. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, we'll try that. We've got Ruth um, Williams, who is Head of Marine Conservation at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. We've got Louise Thomas, who's a, um, well, she's a farmer, firstly, but she's also a trustee of Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, we've got Wesley Smith, who's area manager um, for Natural England for Cornwall, Devon and the Isles of Scilly. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got Professor Kevin Gaston from the University of Exeter. Yeah, there's, there's probably a longer introduction to, to you, Kevin, but um, we'll, we'll let that come out in time. So um, Kevin is actually going to go first, and we've asked each of the speakers to try and speak uninterrupted for four minutes-ish, 
um, on this subject. Is, is, is getting 30% of Cornwall uh, managed for nature's recovery by um, 2030? Is it possible? Kevin, is it possible? I'm going to start by ruining Carolyn's meeting. I uh, reframe the question. And I want to ask whether we can afford not to undertake such restoration, and do we have a credible alternative plan? And I believe that the answer to both those questions is an emphatic no, we don't. First, the level of depletion of nature has been extraordinarily severe. Much of Cornwall may be green, but it's lost most of its wildlife. You can provide lots of statistics to demonstrate this, and you'll have heard many of those in the media. They're, they're cropping up quite regularly. In the UK, we now have the most depleted biodiversity in Europe of any country, and amongst the most depleted of any country in the world. But the statistic that I continue to find the most extraordinary one is that there is now only just over one pair of breeding birds per person in Britain. Think about that the next time you see somebody cutting a hedge at the wrong time of year or taking a tree down, or whatever, what that might mean in that context. That's probably true, that statistic also of Cornwall. Another quick statistic, roughly a half of the birds in Britain have a total population that's fewer than the number of people living in Falmouth or potentially the number of people living in Penny. Mm -hmm. We really are dealing with very little nature being left. Very many species of organisms have now been reduced below the levels at which they can provide meaningful ecosystem functions, pollination, seed dispersal, and so forth. They may still be present, but they're functionally extinct. And as things change, very many more species will disappear from the places in which they continue to persist. They're part of what we call an extinction debt. They're committed to extinction because of things we've already done to them, and unless we reverse those things, they will go. Such depletion of our wildlife has been foolish for three main reasons. Nature is not so nice to have. Fundamentally, biodiversity underpins our existence, including our economic and our social life. It underpins our health and well-being, it provides key resources, it regulates key cycles, and it provides key social services. Depletion of wildlife is economically costly. Many Direct businesses, directly and indirectly, depend on biodiversity. And increasingly, we find ourselves failing with technological solutions to solve problems of, for example, water treatment, flood risk, nutrient cycles. Natural solutions to many challenges that we face have time and again proven to be more cost effective. And depletion of, of wildlife also reduces the resilience of our ecosystems to future change such as climate change, and multiplicity of species increases the likelihood that when some are impacted, others will be able to take their place. If you like, biodiversity has an insurance capability to it. Against this background, why would any of us, whether we are an owner, a manager, or a tenant of a huge estate, of a domestic garden, of a window box, not want to facilitate biodiversity restoration? In preparing for this session, I can think of five possible reasons. First, you might not just not think that you need to contribute to increasing wildlife because you don't think a solution is needed. We can, if you like, turn this biodiversity change denial. Second, you might uh, think that you don't need to be part of the solution, but much like climate change, this is a situation where everyone is impacted and everyone needs to play their part. Third, you might think that there's enough wildlife where you are already. I can assure you there are a few instances where that's the case. Fourth, 
you might not know how to increase wild life. This room is full of people who can tell you how to do that. And finally, you might not be able to afford to increase wildlife, especially in straitened times. And clearly, we need to campaign for the resources that are required. But lots of solutions are cheap or potentially at no cost. There was never some grand plan to reduce the biodiversity of Cornwall to its present state. It was a consequence of thousands and thousands of independent decisions that aggressively eroded it. Likewise, it would take thousands of decisions to bring it back. 30 by 30 is, to my mind, about a grand unifying vision for those decisions. Thank you, Kevin. We're slightly over time, so well done. Um, Wesley, I think you're next up. Now, you can choose to sit, you can stay seated, or you can come and stand here. It's up to you. Can you hear me? Thank you for that very um, positive and I can see. And I'm going to try and sort of um, talk about about the issue about what's possible actually and what the role of government might be in making that possible. Um, so a lot of people characterise um, government as something that promises a lot and delivers little. Uh, it's about red tape, it's about bureaucracy and of course it is about all those things. Um, but more fundamentally it's about actually how do we as a society, uh, promote conservation in a way that meets the balances about of, of the whole host of demands that, that uh, expect society has in terms of expectations. Um, so governments just reflect what people in this country want. Uh, and I think we just have to bear in mind when we think about government and when we, when we think about whether 3030 is possible, Actually, we all have a big part to play in that because government operates at many different levels. It operates at the international level, uh, and we, you know, we've seen things like COP26 uh, uh, championing the Convention of Biodiversity in this country and and the UK. You know, for for the many things that it hasn't achieved, actually. Uh, made some really big statements at COP26, and COP26 was really important in pulling together and sh and and uh, illustrating to the world that actually climate change and the ecological crisis we're facing are two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, but it also has an important role to play within the national. Um, uh, national sphere. And I think that, you know, it is a huge challenge, 2030, and what can be achieved by 2030. And we know that we've made many promises as a country before and haven't fulfilled. We've had um, uh, commitments around reversing biodiversity loss by uh, 2020. We've had commitments about reversing biodiversity loss uh, uh, through uh, 2030 to 2050. So, you know, there have been lots of commitments in the past. And, and the question is, why have we failed to deliver on those? And it's not just about government's inability to, to deliver on its, on its promises. It's also about actually how we as a society choose to put emphasis on the importance of nature. Um, so what's going to change that may make it possible to deliver by 2030? Well, I think that the big difference that's happened in the last couple of years is uh, one of them is around some of the opportunities that may come out of a new way of funding the agricultural sector, the commitment to provide public money for public goods. That has a really important part to play. 
The other things that have come out are things like the Environment Bill, the Environment Act that was passed in November, where there is actually now going to be statutory targets to move us from a position of trying to protect the best of what's left to recovery nature. And that is a really important change in government policy. We're no longer in the position where what we're trying to do is stop the decline. We're now moving into a position where actually the ambition of government is around reversing that decline. So the history of where we've come to, you know, right back from things like the 1949 uh, National Park and Access to the Countryside Act, was all about trying to slow and slot, stop decline. We're now moving into a position where actually we're setting ourselves a target about reversing that decline. And we can talk about that in a minute, about what the tools are for delivering that. But that is a fundamental change in government's attitude to nature. Brilliant. Thank you, Wes, from Natural England. <laughs> Cheryl Marriott, Head of Conservation at Cornwall Wildlife Trust, over to you. Thank you. I'll, I'll stay here so I don't fall over on the way over there. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Does that sound okay? Is it too close? Okay. Um, I'm going to say, talk about what I like about the 2030 target and what worries me about it. Um, I, there's four things I like about it. I like more things than I don't like, so that's, that's positive. I like that it's, um, it says what we need to do in a very clear way. And I think because we need to get way, way more people involved in being part of the solution, it's really important that we're communicating in very clear ways. So I like that. It says what it needs. It's a quite wrong to say. It says what, it, what we need to do. It's on the tip. I also like that it's got a deadline. And that that deadline is very soon, 2030. Yeah. Feedback, how does anyone know how to stop that? Yeah. Sorry, that's completely ruined my flow, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I start again? <laughs> start the class. Yeah. I like that it's very simple language and very clear. I like that there's a deadline of 2030, and that deadline is quite soon. So that really puts across the urgency of, of the situation. It also puts it on a par with the climate emergency, because we have to be tackling the, the ecological crisis and the climate emergency at the same time, because they are inextricably linked. Arguably, if you're serious about net zero, you're talking about 2030 targets, not 2050 targets. So having that joint deadline it's really important. I also like that it's not just us nature conservation people talking about this target. Local government is talking about it, Cornwall Council very, very supportive and, and leading the way on this kind of stuff. National government's talking about it, international governments are talking about it, and I can't think of another nature conservation initiative where the whole world is using the same language, so that's got to be a good thing. The fourth thing that I like about it is that we're talking about land-based conservation and marine using the same terms. And all too often marine conservation, as Ruth will, I'm sure, support me on, it gets a bit forgotten about because it's out there and it's, um, it's out of sight, out of mind. So there's lots of good things about it. Some but, and there's always ifs and buts, one thing that worries me is, even though it sounds very clear and straightforward, once you start looking into it, it gets more complex. And we've got to be wary about how others interpret that very straightforward sentence and maybe try and pull the wool over our eyes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, in 2020, Boris Johnson committed the UK to 30% by 2030 and proudly announced that we were already at 26%, which sounds great. We've only got 4% to go. The coll a collective of wildlife organisations said actually it's closer to 8. It might, it's probably lower than that. There's a big difference between 26% and 8%. 
Um, Boris is including all of the national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty. Those are primarily landscape designations. There's only a quite a modest proportion of them that are actually really high value for nature. So just, just a word of caution about um, keeping an eye on how others interpret it. Can we deliver it? Is it possible? I, th I think it is. If, so here's, there's more ifs and buts, mm. we definitely need more people getting involved. We're all part of the problem. It's not about blaming anybody for this. We're all part of the problem. We're all part of the solution as well. But we're going to need to change gear or change up two or three gears. And we're going to have to be bolder in the things that we do. And I hope that Cornwall Wildlife Trust is starting to be bolder in what we're doing. Um, my last point um, is, is about the government initiative, and yeah, we are all waiting desperately for the new agricultural schemes to come out. We can't wait for Elm to be here and deliver on all its promises. Um, and when, when it is here, we'll embrace it and we'll use it, however, whatever it looks like. But we can't sit and wait. We've got to get on and take action now. I think in Cornwall, we're very good at working together. I think we know what we need to do. Um, I think we've got a real passion for our place, so I think we've got all the right ingredients there to, to change gear, step up our action and, and um, get on with the task. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm here representing the farmers, um, popular for one, popular. Um, I farm with my husband and my brother-in-law um, just outside of Penzance, and as well as being a farmer's wife, I'm also a farmer's daughter, so um, I probably should have an investment to, to marry one. Um, but I skated for a while, um, I studied for a degree in agriculture, and I worked for um, several companies and um, supplying supermarkets of food, so I've sort of seen both sides, the supplier and, um, and farming aspects of it. Um, I moved back to Cornwall to really see how I could establish myself within the farming industry here um, and to bring back some of my experiences back to Cornwall. Um, and I think I've got an increasing frustration with the search. I'm trying to find a truce between the, the farmer and the conservationist. And I think there seems to be at loggerheads, and that's not really where I think we should be. Um, which led me to be a, become um, a trustee of the Cornwall Wildlife Trust last autumn which has been fascinating. And I do sometimes feel a little bit like the fox in the hen house, um, but I do feel the farmer's voice needs to be heard. We're not great self publicists and I'm not sure we should be relying on Jeremy Clarkson as our spokesman, <laughs> as good as may be. <laughs> We've got a mixed farm, we're about 500 acres um, with dairy cattle, we supply milk for David's Stowe cheddar cheese. We raise our beef cattle from the calves and the dairy herds, as well as growing maize um, and cereals. So this is a really good cyclical system. It's bringing um, the dung from the cattle that's being pushed back on the fields so we're building organic matter. We're using some of our corn to feed the cattle. So we've got a really good system. We've also got um, environmental options being built into this. So we have bird food, we have herbal lays, we have lemon for pasture. So it's a really nice cyclical mix of options to build biodiversity on the farm. Um, and as the 30%, it's, it's a tricky one. When I agreed to become part of this panel, I wanted a definition. I wanted to know what that meant. What does 30% look like? Did I, what did I need to do to tick that box? And I didn't really know. Um, and then I thought, well, it's not that simple. Maybe I'll look at it another way. Maybe I'll look at our approach to our farm and I'll allocate 30% of that farm. To biodiversity, to recover in nature. But that left me with 70%. And what was I doing with that? But that was being environmentally managed as well. We weren't ignoring the environment, we weren't ignoring biodiversity on that part of the farm. We just needed to manage it differently. And I think some parts, they have to be managed more intensively, and that's what we need to do to earn an income. But it's not to say that that's bad either. Farming isn't a bad thing, it can be done hands in hand with the environment. Um, I think we do our best with the areas that we are cropping. We're trying to manage the organic matter in the soil, using methods to reduce our pesticide use. We're being very careful about the management of our hedgerows. And we see that as quite a key part of the biodiversity on the farms, managing that network of hedges. 
Well, I do think we need to look at food production and conservation as one. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think we put them in two separate pots. And farmers have a lot to learn from conservationists. But on the flip side, I think conservationists and policymakers have to learn from farmers too. And we need a successful farming industry to protect the countryside and complement the areas that have been taken out of food production. Which I suppose is my final short brief point. We need to look, when we're looking for the search for biodiversity, increasing biodiversity, it must be pursued at the expense of our food security and food sustainability. Farmers have always been in poverty. We're guilty of, I guess, crime war for so long now as the uncertainty of supermarkets and push prices down and down. And I think the wolf is getting quite close now. We're getting a little bit scared now of how much more price pressures we can take. We've had huge increases in inputs. We're being squeezed from that side. We're not seeing the, the rise in the cost of our milk sales. Um, the cost of the milk price we get for our milk, we're being pushed from environmental regulations as well. So it's just getting getting quite difficult. So we need to balance all that and balance how we find money to, to implement all the um, all the regulations that are going to rob at us. So I think biodiversity and conservation relationship is important, um, but they need to go hand in hand and mustn't be expensive foods. So I just think we need to be quite careful about choices made on food and, and where that comes from and how it impacts biodiversity. So I think it can be done, but we just need to manage it very carefully. So Ruth, the marine um, aspect of it all. Yes, I'm the watery one on this, or salty one on this panel maybe. Um, we've heard a little bit about the terrestrial recovery in terms of 30 by 30, um, but I just want to, to bring in the sea here. Um, and, and talk a little bit about what does recovery look like in our marine environment, our marine ecosystems. Um, well, basically it's the same principles. We need to give nature at sea the space and the time to be able to thrive and to survive and, and to recover. Um, we need to rebuild those systems that give the many societal benefits that we all, we all know and need from a healthy uh, ocean. And that can be done in a couple of ways. We can either have active restoration, and that's things like seagrass reseeding and salt marsh restoration, the things that hit the headlines, or there's passive restoration, passive recovery. And that's more about removing the pressures to allow nature to do its thing, to recover in its own time. And that's often more cost effective, more simple, you know, just remove the pressures um, and, and let nature do the, do the rest. But um, marine nature recovery is very different to how we, we work on land. Um, and it's got to be borne in mind. Um, we don't own the seabed. We can't, um, we can't fence off areas like we do um, our nature reserves or our farmland um, and manage it for recovery and to set targets and, and to determine how much is, is in good status compared to, to bad. It's much, much more difficult in the sea. Um, the sea is used by many. It's, it's a common resource and that's an issue in its own, in its own right. And it relies a lot, it relies really heavily on regulation, on legislation, and on industry action and buy-in to achieve that, that, sort of, that progress towards recovery. So it is very, very difficult um, and much more different in the marine ecosystem. Um, it takes a lot longer to get some of that legislation through, and it's often out of one organisation or one body's control. It's, it's down to the many. Having said that, um, in, in Cornwall alone, in our inshore waters, and by that I mean between north and 12 nautical miles out to sea, we've got 36% in uh, designated as marine protected area. Now, you know, that's, that's way above this 30 by 30. Surely we're way on track in Cornwall leading the way. Um, no, as similarly to what uh, Cheryl was saying earlier, only 8% of, of that inshore water is effectively managed. And by that, I mean um, properly protected against things like bottom drilling. So we've got a long way to go. A lot of our NPAs are still lines on maps. They're, they're paper parts, if you will. So we've got to effectively manage these, these what are our really, what could be and should be our reserves at sea. Um, many marine protected areas um, are also, or all marine protected areas really, are designated for specific features only. And they're, they're still multi-use. Um, and only activities that impact those specific features are, are prohibited. 
Um, and that means that we're not looking at the whole site. We're only impact, uh, affecting the, the issues that impact those specific features. And for recovery and for the whole interlinked ecosystem to work, we've got to look at that ecosystem as a whole and manage the sites as a whole. So um, that whole site recovery is essential for, uh, for, um, for achieving this 30 by 30. And that next level is what we're looking at, a highly protected marine area. You may have heard of HPMAs been bandied around for the last couple of years. And that's, that's the sort of gold star. That's what we really need to start achieving um, through re recovery at sea. The government have committed to this. Um, they, they have said that they will designate five highly protected marine areas by the end of this year, but we're yet to see a short list of that. So we're watching that space very closely. Really hopeful that we'll get one in Cornwall or in the southwest at least. Um, so is 30 by 30 in the sea realistic? Um, and if not, what do we need to do? Um, ever the optimist, I think it probably can be, um, and we have to make it um, possible, but only with real urgency now. Um, we haven't got time to, to waste if we're going to hit this by 2030. Our current MPA network isn't properly protected, and so we have to take some uh, really difficult decisions. We really need to, to accelerate things and ramp up the um, ramp things up to ensure that we've got that effective management. And a good start to that is banning bottom trawling in our marine protected areas. That's just bonkers that we're allowing that destructive activity in our prime, prime areas. There's a lot of other sea in between, let's make, make that a first one. We need highly protected marine areas for that true whole site recovery. And ideally we need more than five around our English coast. And we need to level up all of our marine protected areas towards that same high level of protection, that gold standard. Um, we, the collective we, can inform and influence policy but we all need to take local action as well. We need to find those win-wins, those collaborative solutions at a local level that are really going to, to make a difference as well. So kind of to sum that up, um, I think we need to be optimistic in light of the doom and the gloom. You know, the, the, the data is there and it's real, but 30 by 30 is possible. Um, but it is a massive task to achieve in eight years, which is all we've got left before 2030. And we need everyone collaborating from the top and decision makers right down to the local coastal communities and everyone in between. Um, and we need to get moving along. <laughs> We've got to have urgent action and, and do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> So we've now got um, 15 minutes or so for the panel to have a conversation amongst themselves. And let's start, um, let's start with um, the theme that Ruth just left on. Um, we've got a whole room full of people here. We've got a lot of people sitting at home watching this debate, thinking themselves about what they can do to contribute towards um, the 30%, which I think we've concluded is possible, if we're all optimistic. Um, what, oh, come on panel, what can everyone do to contribute towards this target? We've got some big decision makers here, some really influential people who are um, taking big decisions on behalf of Cornwall. And we've got normal people like me who live and are bringing up a family in Cornwall. So what can we all do? Um, something that most of us, if not all of us, can do um, is to think about where our money is and change our, our banking um, and our pensions to climate and nature friendly organisations. There's a, um, a campaign by Richard Curtis called Make My Money Make My Money Matter. Yeah, Make My Money Matter. And I was I was thinking about this last night and I thought I'm such a hypocrite because I've banked with the same bank since I was a child. Um, so I stopped my preparation for this and I went and set up a current account with Triodos. Um, and now I've got to do the hassle bit of switching things across. But I've made a start. I'm not a hypocrite in terms of banking and that is something that we can all do. Thank you, Cheryl. Where's the you going to the microphone there? Can do. Um, so I think there are, there are some, some things that we can all engage in. So at the moment, um, there is a public consultation on the Nature Recovery Green Paper that the government is running, and that will have really long, um, long reaching and long lasting effects for the way in which we think about protected sites and protected species in this country. And all of us 
can contribute and put our views forward uh, in, into that consultation. So that's one of the things that you can do as an individual. Um, uh, Cornwall Council and the Isles of Scilly will be um, starting to develop their local nature recovery strategy over the next uh, 12 months or so. And that will be a really important part of how we think about nature recovery in Cornwall. And um, one of the lessons that um, we've learned is that actually for these sorts of um, approaches to, to gain traction and to, to have real fight is that they need to have that democratic mandate. Um, so organizations such as the one I work for, Natural England, the Wildlife Trust, you know, we produce lots of strategies over the years which talk about what's needed to address the problem, what we need to put in place to build networks for wildlife and so on. And actually those, those strategies have been absolutely fantastic documents, uh, been forward looking, but they haven't really made the sort of traction that we'd all hoped. We've now moved into a position where actually local governments so that's the other arm of government. There's international, there's national, but there's also local. Local government will be producing a statutory local nature recovery strategy. And I would just encourage everybody to get involved in those discussions, to, to reflect actually what you all want to see in terms of nature recovery in the local area in which you live. Thanks, Wiz. And you can find out all about the local nature recovery strategy on the Common Council website with a quick Google. There's uh, some good resources on the Council's website that tell you all about it. Um, does anyone else want to have a go at that question or should we move on to a different thing? Kevin? Okay, so I guess we've touched on individuals and to some extent communities. Um, many, many people are, are small business owners and understanding there are lots of increasingly lots and lots of tools out there now as to understanding what your biodiversity uh, reliance is and what your biodiversity impact is and moving your businesses towards more circular economies of exploring those things which i think is important in this space great so any businesses in the room again there's lots of resources on the tebby website that's a coolish project where you can find out about what you can do to support the environment and wildlife. Um, let's move on to a different topic. Um, there's been a lot of development in Cornwall over the last 10 to 20 years, and there will be more with the local plan. Um, so housing um, has been growing, and housing needs to grow because we know there's a housing crisis. Um, what impact do you think development is having on wildlife, and how might this pan out over the next few years up until 2030. Quite possibly controversially, I don't think it's having as big an impact as we might think on wildlife. It certainly shouldn't be now with the um, improvement <coughs> we've had in, in um, planning policy and guidance over the last few years including now, and Cornwall was the lead in this um, of adopting the biodiversity net gain approach. So for um, certain size developments now, developers don't just have to um, not create, not damage wildlife, they have to create, leave more, they have to design it in such a way that there's more wildlife at the end of their development, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but if you choose the right site for your development, um, one that is has low um, biodiversity value to start with, then you can actually get more wildlife on the site if it's if it's um, designed and built in the right way. I think we worry a lot about development because it's so obvious to us when we're driving around Cornwall and you see all the new developments. But it's we've got about eight percent of Cornwall is is built up with roads or, or housing and other things. Seventy five percent of Cornwall is down to productive agriculture. So I think our attention really should be helping the farmers to do better on that land. We've got to do the right thing and, and make sure development is in the right place and happens in the right way, but it's not my biggest concern. If that noises me, I'm sorry. I don't know where it's coming from. 
Louise, did you want to follow up on, on, on that? So Cheryl is basically saying that we need to support farmers more than we need to support developers, so which is the best news ever. I'm glad okay. Um, I think this, this is, this is five percent of all is farmland, and that's such a huge opportunity. <coughs> I think farmers have, with the way the subsidy payments are, are being made now, farmers have never been more willing to listen to to ideas about how to improve their farm. And I think some ideas are so simple. Some ideas don't actually cost anything, but it's just getting that across the farm, not demonising the farmers, not making the farmers out to be the polluters and, and there are accidents that happen, of course there are, but, but we're not all bad. We're trying to do our best and if people like the Quent Cornwall Wildlife Trust can help us and help educate how best to improve and how we can do that for least cost, then that's all good and that's a fantastic opportunity and we're in a really exciting place to explore that right now. Thanks Louise. And just as we're supporting farmers, we also need to be supporting people who are using the marine industry in the marine area. So I don't know, Ruth, if you want to say something about that, and then maybe Wes as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, development on land isn't just impacting wildlife and, and nature on land. We've got to think of it as all joined up and that catchment approach. <laughs> um, and it's it's one whole. So any any pressures and, and runoff from, from terrestrial development and, and concreting over roads, housing developments, all affects um, particularly water quality in our estuaries, which then runs off. So we must think about it all as a whole. Historically, um, marine and terrestrial stuff has been siloed and there's still a strong element of that. We've got to start thinking of everything being much, much more joined up. Um, in terms of marine development, um, there's there's a huge amount happening at RCs, um, and everybody wants their piece. Of it. Like I said in my talk, you know, it's it is a common resource, and everybody thinks that it's their right to, to access that. Um, our spatial plans that we hoped would would help this um, haven't really come to fruition. They haven't been able to to divide up RCs at the at the moment to to make sure that those cumulative impacts. On our seas aren't having a negative um, effect. There's there's quite a lot of work nationally now looking at um, marine spatial prioritisation so that we can make sure that all activity at sea can can work alongside each other. There's plenty out there, but it just needs to be thought about in a logical and strategic way. Um, and we mustn't. And I think it's it's key for as a sort of an NGO and an environmental NGO particularly not to have a negative view of development and um, progress on land and sea. As Cheryl says, right thing in the right place at the right time. Um, there's a huge resource out there and it's coming um, our way in terms of floating offshore winds as a marine renewable. Um, there's historically quite a lot of um, negativity about that because we don't know what the impacts are going to be. And our stands would normally be quite a, a precautionary one. But we're looking at the urgency which has come through from the panel right from the start that we need to have action now for our biodiversity and our climate. If we're going to have green renewables at sea, let's make sure it's in the right place and um, minimise those, those potential impacts from the outset. And that's all about coming back to this collaboration. Let's talk to the developers from the outset to make sure that what we get um, at sea is, is fit for purpose and, um, and that can actually benefit wildlife in terms of net gain and some of the other issues that, that we can uh, bring in. Thanks Ruth. And Wes, did you want to follow up on anything on that and then just kind of move on? Yeah, just a couple of quick things. So one was, um, you know, um, it's great to hear that the panel has mentioned biodiversity net gain, so that's one of the things that came through the Environment Act, the statutory requirement now for, for when development happens for there to be a net gain for biodiversity rather than a biodiversity loss. I think that it is easy to concentrate on development because it's an obvious change in a landscape uh, and I think that, that makes it seem um, disproportionately impactful than, than some other land use changes. Um, but we also have to remember that development can bring huge benefits for wildlife as well. And if it's done in the right way, uh, if it incorporates green infrastructure, we you know we know from from some of the work done looking at populations of garden birds actually, uh, or, or populations of birds, some populations are higher 
in suburban and urban areas than they are in the wider countryside. So if we get it right, it can be uh, a benefit. Thanks, Wes. And Kevin, final word from this section. Okay, Wes has stolen my quote anyway. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just think that in, in terms of extending, if you like, beyond, beyond urban development to urban and villages and towns are, are important havens even for increasing numbers of species. And I do worry about the kind of the emergence of the convenience garden, which removes the hedge and replaces it with a fence. And, Dread of all dreads, the plastic lawn, you know, it's, and so and that erosion, I think, is is something that we should resist very vigorously, particularly because um, villages and towns are often the, the centres for the abundance of some key species. Thank you, Kevin. Right now, now it's over to you. Um, if you're at home, uh, get writing any questions that you've got on in the feed on the YouTube page. Um, but if you're here in the room, Helen at the back is um, waiting to come to you to help you ask your question of the panel. So uh, please indicate to Helen if you would like to ask a question. There you go, Helen, very eager first person, quick off the draw. Right, okay, okay. I haven't got any feedback. Um, I'm Peter James, I'm a farmer um, from West Cornwall again. Yeah. Um, and there's one thing that intrigues me more than anything else is how do we match the fact that uh, food poverty in Cornwall and across the whole country is increasing rapidly? And um, on top of that, we all know from watching the TV that the price of food is going to go up even more. Um, how do we match that in with managing the environment and feeding people? affordably. Because um, as I see it as a commercial farmer, the biggest enemy the environment has had is cheap food, be it in this country or chopping down the Amazon or sucking the water dry in California to grow almonds. But I can't work out how you get the answer when people are struggling to feed themselves as it is. Yeah, really good point. Peter, um, who would like to have a go first at responding to that? Louise, do you want yeah, to have a go? Well, <laughs> my fellow farmer. Sorry, Louise. <laughs> no, 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 no it's, it's a really, really real issue. It's not, I don't have the answer to it, but it's it's becoming more and more of a problem, and it, I don't know how we get out of it because somebody said the other day, a farmer in the red can't be green, and I think that's become increasingly more apparent. The, particularly in the dairy industry now, the price for getting farm milk isn't enough to cover our costs. We've had huge rises in fertiliser, in our diesel, in our feed, in, in everything that we use to, to create milk. And yet our milk price, the price that we receive, is less than it was 12 years ago. That makes no sense to me. And on top of that, we've got environmental regulations coming in um, from the autumn. They're, they're changing slightly, but that means we have to build stores for our slurry, which have to be covered. Um, the cost of that could be 200,000, 250,000 pounds. And there isn't the investment, there isn't the money there for that investment. So it's a real trade off and it's a real worry um, for us because we need that more money, but yet the pressures are there for, for food inflation. And how that circle gets squared and square gets it, I, I don't know, but it, it's a real issue that we're going to have to face very soon. Cheryl, I don't have the answer either, <laughs> but because, because the food system is almost broken, the, where we've got to now, um, with over half of our, the cereal production in Europe is to feed cows, we've got, we're importing all this um, plant protein in the form of soy from, from Latin America, yet in Europe, um, we're on, I'm going to keep still. on average, we're, eat, we're all eating three times as much sugar as we should. We're eating double the amount of protein that is healthy for us. And most of us aren't eating enough fruit, veg, and fibre. So we're not looking after ourselves. And we're not looking after the environment either. We've got it upside down and back to front and inside out. Um, that isn't really helping, is it? But there, there was a really interesting study done looking at if Europe switched to completely regenerative farming, so if we were 
massively reduced fertilizer use, pesticide use, made space for nature, um, and looked after soils, could we feed ourselves with a growing population in Europe? And they came up with the answer that yes, we can, um, even with yields 35% lower. Um, but they worked it out with a, that's, that's feeding ourselves in a more healthy way. So we all need to change our habits. It's not going to happen overnight, but there is enough land and we can do it with wildlife. We just need some huge changes. So um, perhaps we should all be looking at our own diets. I've no idea if I'm eating the right amount of protein or not. I do try and eat low amounts of good local produce. Um, and perhaps if everybody did that and, and we buy seafood from the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, that, that would help. Um, so, yeah. Have you got any answers, Peter? Yeah, I wish I did. He doesn't have a microphone either, Helen, so if you could give him the microphone. Um, and I agree with everything that you just said. And I actually believe a huge. Sorry, I don't know if I need the microphone. <laughs> I actually believe a huge amount of the problem is. Uh, around the food production and the environment actually stems from education and going back into the schools and explaining the link between the environment and food production and more importantly teaching people to actually eat healthily and respect what they're eating because as a farmer nothing gets me mad than food waste I absolutely detest it um, so I agree with all those points but I'm not sure that that addresses food poverty. Okay, have we got any more questions from the floor? Um, Helen, if you just row three, there's a lady in the floral jacket. <laughs> on the way. And then there's one in front, in the row in front afterwards. Thank you. Oh, yeah, hi, I'm Philip Oskin, Nature Recovery Manager at Cornwall Council, and it's great to hear from the panel. And, Everything was fantastic talks, and I just wanted to know from the panel um, what or where do you think calls next recovery should be over the next few years that are going to make the biggest difference towards the 30 by 30 targets? So, which sort of habitats or locations? Because you know, if we're going to go at this speed, we've to some degree we've really got to kind of hone our priorities, and we can't just keep doing everything everywhere. It's not making sufficient difference. Um, so yeah, what or where should be our make recovery priorities? Great, good question, Pip. Um, who would like to go to Wes? Would you like to have a go first? <laughs> um, well, I think the, as I said earlier, you know, one of the things that we need to do is actually get the people of Cornwall to to express an opinion on this because um, where the evidence might point to might be different from where the opportunities are. And I think that, um, uh, you know, delivering nature recovery in Cornwall is going to be a combination of targeted intervention, but also taking advantage of, of opportunities as they arise. Um, I think, you know, Cornwall has some unique offerings, I suppose, in the, in the world of biodiversity, you know, which, which aren't found uh, in other parts of the country. So I think you know we we should we should certainly look at you know the, the special things that are about formal wildlife. Some of its heathlands, uh, some of its uh, bird communities, um, its coastal environment, including the marine environment. You know there there are obvious places where I think we we would want to focus effort based on evidence. But at the end of the day, nature recovery will only be achieved if we get sufficient uh, land managers and people who and decision makers on board. You know we need to remember that um, as has been pointed out, you know nearly eighty percent of the land in Cornwall is farmland owned private. The farming community is going to be absolutely key to delivering nature recovery. And we, we need to make sure that we've got the right advice, the right incentives, and the right framework in place to allow farmers to take advantage of that. Thanks, Wes. Who else would like to have a go? Kevin. So it's, uh, it's, it's the kind of Norton mantra, isn't it? It's the bigger, better, and more connected. And probably in that sequence that we need to restore bigger areas, 
we need to improve the quality of those areas and we need to improve the connection. And I think I think one of the things that worries me around quite a lot of the discussion around the nature of recovery, and you know that I feel this way, but is is that disproportionate emphasis goes sort of based on connecting things without making protected areas bigger, make without improving the quality of those things, and those things will themselves improve the connectivity. Um, I, if we don't do that, then we can connect all sorts of things up and potentially it's a very little game. So I think we need to improve what we have already have, expand it, improve its quality, and then think about connecting it better. Okay, Cheryl. <coughs> Thank you. Just just to make that tangible from a, a common wildlife trust point of view, we're looking at one of our largest nature reserves at the moment, and we I'm looking at buying some more land right next to it. Um, so that's increasing the size of one of our existing nature reserves. That then means we're better able to manage that nature reserve so that it can really um, fulfill its potential for wildlife. So that's the, the bigger and the better. Um, <coughs> we're very interested as well as in um, reintroducing wild beavers onto that site. And they'll then be managing 20 metres at least either side of, of the streams, um, letting in light, bringing in, making a bit of chaos and dynamism, um, damming the stream to hold the floodwaters back that will that do cause problems further down. So just just to bring that to life, that's how I see um, just one of the, our contributions for the nature recovery. But it, so let's let's make sure we're looking after our new nature uh, nature reserve, making it bigger. There are private landowners around Cornwall that are, are buying up land, and um, so it is taking some land out of um, food production. Or oh, food production isn't then the primary aim. They're, they're bringing wildlife first and then producing less food, but still producing food. So, and I think we have to allow. Well, we can't stop it. It's okay if a bit of that is happening, so long as we obviously we've got to feed ourselves and we can't have that happening everywhere. But I think given the biodiversity crisis, some land being used in a different way is positive. And then of course out, around our nature reserves, it's working with the farmers to um, to help bring in more regenerative practice. So that's that's how I'm envisaging it just from the farm. So we can't say where that land is yet. But keep an eye on our social media over the next couple of weeks. And uh, if anyone's got a big chunk of cash to help us buy it, we'd be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Now we're running out of time. So, Ruth, if you want to give a, a short answer to this, and then, I'm, then Tom, I'm going to come to you and see if there's any questions uh, from everyone at home. Um, a short answer <laughs> to cover all, all the scenes. Um, Pip, I assume you're just talking about um, Cornwall's waters. In terms of where I prioritise marine nature recovery, um, I think our, our marine protected areas, certainly in the inshore waters, weren't picked as being the prime sites. They, it was a collaborative stakeholder-led process and, and there was a lot of compromise. So out of our marine protected areas, it would be great to see some, some proper whole sites um, being recovered, but I would pick the ones that are going to have the biggest hits, so the ones that have got High up by highest biodiversity and the carbon habitats, so you get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, I think there's also scope to, to look outside of that and, and look at nature recovery in the wider seas. And there's probably some good good things that we can do there that we haven't really touched on much um, just due to time. But working with fishermen, we can um, we can find way, sustainable ways that they can change their practices, which doesn't impact their their financial um, business plan. So setting their nets for shorter soak times, earlier in the day, save some fuel, save some time, put it, um, and they catch the same amount of fish, but it minimizes the number of cetaceans and other species that they buy catch. So they can then sell their fish as more sustainable catch, they get a higher premium price. So there's, these are the sort of win-wins and collaborative solutions that I mentioned before. I think those, those wider um, things in the, in the marine environment need to be considered as well as the NPA network. Thanks, Ruth. I'm sorry, I wasn't doing that on purpose. I might have been by mistake. Tom, have you got any interesting questions you want to? Yeah, we've got lots of interesting questions from people at home, so we won't be able to get to all of them. There's one from Dan here who wants to talk about data 
And he says the, the target is legally binding. So to hold the government to account, we need a lot of defendable data, well presented and accessible. How do we do that? Hmm. I wonder who I'm going to ask to respond to this question first. <laughs> Kevin, would you like to? Well, clearly this, that's going to be interesting in terms of how the targets are actually developed. It's going to be, be interesting to see how, how the targets are developed in relationship to the availability of data. Um, but broadly, we need to improve the quality of our data collection um, and we need to start tweaking a lot of our data collection schemes to actually uh, improve their coverage. Cornwall actually hasn't historically had great coverage of any really important monitoring schemes. And then actually tweaking some of our data collection and more ad hoc data collection actually to improve the utility of those data in addressing these kind of questions. Marine things. <laughs> Marine things. Um, this is something I'm quite passionate about, actually. Um, I think in terms of the urgency, we've got enough data to know that we need to take action now. We know where we can prioritise, but we do need to monitor that success. And as I alluded to earlier in my little um, brief, um, it's very difficult to monitor some of those things So we, in the marine environment particularly. So we need to look at proxy indicators and, and trends rather than hard targets that we are held to count to. But in terms of um, data and those indicators, we're gathering a lot of data already through citizen science um, projects, um, particularly through the Wildlife Trust projects, but we've got a huge amount of data that's coming in that isn't being recognised by um, the government and some of the government agencies as being scientifically robust. But that data is being collected under existing programmes so it's not costing a fortune, um, it's being collected on a regular basis, it's being analysed on an annual basis, and that's key to, to monitoring our success and against recovery. It can't wait five years for a sort of monitoring cycle. It's got to be done annually so we can see we're going in the right direction. So I think that locally collected data is, is crucial to be part of this. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so thank you everyone. Thank you, a big thank you to the panellists for, for subjecting themselves to your, your questions. Um, thank you to you all for coming. Thank you to everyone who's watching online at home. Um, this is a special year for Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, it was 60 years ago that some naturalists got together in the Royal Cornwall Museum and decided to start up Cornwall Wildlife Trust. So we're spending this year celebrating the fact that Cornwall Wildlife Trust has been here doing its thing for 60 years and will be doing its thing for at least 60 years more. So this is one of the events that we're host, holding to, to mark the 60th year. So thank you for taking part in this celebration. If you want to do more, there's more things you can do. If you um, have a family or uh, a father, um, you can bring, come along to uh, Lethitep, one of our open gardens on Father's Day in June. That's a special event with other lots of activities for families. There's a programme of open gardens that you can go to. We had the first one yesterday at Pen and Billy. Um, and there will be, for the athletic among you, there will be a, a challenge event later in the autumn, probably at Pen Hale, one of our um, reserves that you only get to go to when, when the MOD lets us take people on there. So it's quite a special site. Um, you can also go to cheer people on, which is probably what I'll be doing. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, Oliver, did you want to come up and say something to close? Whilst all of this is coming up, for those of you in the room, we'll have um, pasties and drinks outside. And for those of you online, thank you for joining us. And there's way more information about the Wildlife Trust on our website. Oliver, final words to you. Thank, thank you, Carolyn. Um, really, just for me to say thank you to Carolyn in particular for hosting us today. And of course, thank you for all this. Just as a, a couple of comments, um, I sort of feel very much an amateur in these um, surroundings, and it's fantastic to see the real professionals and the, 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 the people who really know what they're talking about um, talking to us this evening. And it, it, it helps me in my own education and my own thinking about um, how to behave and what I do on a bit, little bit of an ex farm uh, at home near Camelford. Um, so, thank you for the insights that you provided today. Um, Gerald did mention um, a land acquisition 
uh, which uh, we were happy as a group of trustees to approve last week. Uh, it's in financial terms, it's the largest acquisition that the Wildlife Trust has, has ever made. So, um, and I think. Uh, Tell you where it is, uh, but uh, we, we should be competing in over the next weeks or a couple of months or something, and uh, I think it will become obvious. But uh, and, and I know that there will be uh, a uh, renewed vigor uh, in terms of a round of fundraising to help uh, help fund that one. So or, or help um, would be uh, really useful there. Thank you. Um, mine and Pat. Well, there's a there's a question. Sorry, I just. Um, how much do you need? I'm not really now, I'm afraid I can't be with you, but how much, how much do you need? Um, <laughs> the at the back. How much do you I don't know quite how, how to answer that one. I think Karen is better. Yeah. Sorry, Karen, Karen, no one can hear you online, so if you want to come up, come up. You're a runner, you can get here quickly. <laughs> I didn't realise I'd get this opportunity. Make the most of it. Um, so, um, James, a colleague, is here from fundraising and he's building our fundraising appeal. But we've got um, somebody who's very kindly pledged um, to match pound for pound uh, our appeal raises up to 120,000. Um, so, if we can raise 120,000, we'll have 240,000 towards what's going to be. As Oliver said, our biggest financial acquisition um, of <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it's it's hundreds of thousands. Um, but and and as others have said, it's it's over it's over a million pounds. So it's a it's a big acquisition for us. That's okay, no problem. So you'll see more information about that fundraising appeal come out over. There. Um, week, so we'll make sure that everyone who's on the mailing list of this event gets uh, the full details of how you can contribute. But thank you once again for coming, thank you to the panellists, and thank you for everyone behind the scenes who are now accompanied by the, the cute dog over there. Um, thank you very much for, for all the work you've done to pull this event together, team. It's been awesome. So thank you, enjoy your pasty. <laughs>